Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Jenkins Platform Special Interest Group. We're delighted to have you here. It is April the 23rd of 2020. Agenda wise, we've got um, open action item review. Then I had put core release project, and I think given I propose the following adjustment in count in agenda, we're going to put the Java upcoming topic with Matt Sicker, top of the list, because Matt's joined us this morning. Thanks very much, Matt. Then I had core release project, Windows installer, plugin installation manager. Um, Alex, are you okay on that topic that it's on the agenda? Did you want it to stay there? Um, sure, yeah, I can talk over what, what I'm working on right now with that. Excellent, okay. Platform re Roadmap and Jira Epics, uh, Series 3, uh, the System 390 um, and PowerPC infrastructure status and Docker PR status were the topics that I had put on the list. Anything else that needs to be added to our agenda? All right, then let's go through the action items. So I've still got the open action item to open a JEP for Docker operating system and platform support selection rules. Um, Oleg, you've already opened the JEP for Windows support policy. Anything uh, you want to describe there? No, no JEP. I submitted a proposal uh, to the developer mailing list. After some consideration, I decided that maybe JEP is not needed if there is a consensus. And right now there is a developer mailing uh, this thread uh, linked uh, below, uh, which documents uh, the policy proposal. And I guess our current situation that we would go with multi-level Windows support policy, uh, we will say that uh, recent platforms, uh, baselines, are they actually uh, fully supported and tested. Uh, the rest of the platforms are supported, but uh, well, not tested and uh, there will be also platforms which we explicitly do not support. So it, uh, there is a summary in the mailing list and yeah, any feedback uh, will be appreciated. Great, thank you, thanks very much. All right, and then we had one more to-do item which was the Docker build rework PR that um, Alex, Oleg, and I have got a review. I apologize. I am I have not reviewed it and probably won't review it for at least a week. Alex, I, anything? I, I, I ran a build on one of my systems and it built correctly. I haven't done any testing or looked at the, the script updates yet. I, I need to. Okay. Thanks. Anything else on action items? Okay, all right. The next topic is Matt Sicker with Java, Java Upcoming. And I'm gonna turn off my screen sharing so that we can see Matt. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Matt. I'm, uh, I'm from the Jenkins security team, but I'm also um, big into well, the Java platform itself because I use it a lot at Apache as well. So uh, essentially been following development of it um, for a while since try to since um, at some at the patch projects that I like to work with um, we like to at least try to test some things out with the newer version to see if anything broke which is how we for example found out in Java 9 long ago that they had switched how localization had worked and things like that so that was kind of interesting um, but anyway so the so the, the major change that Java has made to um, the release train um, at least a couple years now um, and has been doing as and it's almost coming up to the next LTS, is essentially that starting with Java 9, um, they kind of, you can almost imagine that they've um, adopted Jenkins's release schedule is essentially the way I've kind of um, um, uh, thought of it lately. Because uh, as you know, with Jenkins, how we have weekly releases where new features can always just go in there, um, but we don't support old weekly releases because you just get the latest week weekly release, right? Those are what, uh, that would be how Java is when it comes to versions like 9, 10, 12, 14, 15, and 16, uh, 15 and 16 in the future. Now there's those special LTS releases now, kind of like how Jenkins has LTS releases where we'll just take a version every so often, tag that as an LTS, 
and then backport security fixes and maybe some bug fixes or any actual important things. Um, now you'll note that the interesting comparison here too is, um, well, there's a slight difference comparison there, I guess, is because Jenkins versus OpenJDK, Jenkins does distribute binaries of Jenkins. I mean, you kind of need to, especially for on the Java web start old stuff and everything anyway. Whereas OpenJDK only releases source code still. Um, while they do coordinate strong, uh, directly with all the various distributions that are creating binaries from it, like Adopt OpenJDK, Oracle's JDK, um, uh, Zulu, and, and millions of others now. Um, essentially, these all just come from OpenJDK. So with that in mind, the new LTS schedule is to essentially stabilize around every three years or every six releases, basically, of those um, updates. So kind of similar to where Jenkins, where we'll take like every um, X amount of weekly releases becomes a new LTS release. They are fairly, it is a fairly stable cadence like that, except we're a little more fine grained compared to the, to Java. But I mean, Java is a programming language. It has to release a little slower than us. So in that regard, there's a couple strategies to actually staying up to date with Java. So for one, you want to make sure, of course, that you're um, at least supporting the LTS release because that's what people may be running in production more likely. Um, however, if you're not actually using the LTS release, what you always want to be doing is using the latest version, just like you would be in a, in a Jenkins weekly release. Because if you were using two weeks ago release and you had a bug that was fixed last week, I don't care, right? And neither does, neither does OpenJDK. If, if, if you found a bug in Java 13, they'll be like, sorry, Java 14 is the current version. You know, it's like you can either report it to Java 11 or the latest version, basically. Um, and then when Java 17 comes out, you know, they'll start slowly um, downplaying support or whatever. But here's the fun part, too. The second aspect of this is that now that Oracle has tried to de-emphasize their own central role in Java, it basically kind of, while they still are the primary supporter and primary funders of development and that sort of thing, that that still opens the possibility to all the other companies that um, work on the JDK and maintain their own distributions to make their own LTS releases if they want to. So this is where things could potentially get complicated in the future, but they aren't yet. But the the gist of the LTS thing is there's a so there's a couple things to keep in mind about the LTS schedule. So kind kind of like in Jenkins. Um, new features pop up in an LTS release based on whatever things were sort of in there at the time, right? And that's kind of how um, Java will be now. So in that, in that mind, you know how upgrading from Java 8 to 9 um, kind of sucked? Well, going from 9 to 10, 10 to 11, and so forth should actually be trivial. However, if you keep waiting again, um, or if you start, or especially if you, get, if you get stuck on one of those intermediary releases, you might get really bad. Um, so look, so they're, they're, these are more um, hypothetical issues that can come up if you start trying to use some of the newer things. So let's say, for example, you downloaded Java 14 today, right? And you want to try out the new records feature. And let's say Java 15 comes out in a few months, and that feature was still a preview feature, and they want to fix, and they've changed something about it backwards and compatibly. But the thing was, it was a preview feature that you had to feature flag in. Now, if you had relied on that and, and kind of ignored that update, then the next, you know, basically, the following update might completely remove it. Um, for example, I mean, like, or, well, in the, okay, actually, I'm mixing two things. One, they might remove it in the next release or change it because it was a preview feature. So there's that. On the other hand, there's the new deprecation policy. I think this is probably more important to consider is up until recently, Java has never removed anything that was deprecated. I don't think ever, uh, at least from the um, standard JDK. However, they finally wanted to start changing that after they modularized Java. So there is actually, you know, I mean, besides the fact that they've stopped bundling all, everything besides the base by default, which is something we already had to deal with. Um, now, you know, now they're actually finally slowly trying to get rid of some of the old deprecated classes. And the way this works is they'll essentially mark something for deprecation in one release and it will tell, and basically there'll be, and there can be like another release or two between its removal. But let's say for example, something was marked. Now, I, I don't know of a specific example, but this is something that could theoretically happen is that Java 16 comes out. 
they mark something for removal. Java 17 comes out, it's still in there, you use it, and then Java 18, it's gone. And let's say you never test any version of Java between 17 and 23. And then 23 comes out and you're like, hey, where's my shit? It's like, well, you should have, you, you're supposed to keep trying it out on the new versions to see where your, where your shit went. So essentially, um, it, like, the, the big change of the versioning number is like, as they tried to explain in, the, in various blog posts, this is kind of similar to what they used to do in like Java 8 when they, um, the uh, number after the U would increase by 20 every time they had like a major uh, update like this. So it's like 8U20, 8U40, 8U60. And those are now equivalently 9, 10, 11, and, and so forth. Except now they're, now they're less strict about um, what's allowed in the release though. So imagine, so I guess, you can imagine if Jenkins weekly releases before didn't allow new features. Imagine if we had like some sort of master branch that was collecting all the new features and weekly releases were only like bug fixes and stuff. And then the LTS releases were the ones that came out with the big feature bank, big, the big bang feature release. That's how Java used to work. And as, and as anyone who's been working in Java for long enough knows, that has been terrible. Has been, you know, big bang releases of Java has been horrible. You know, like I, I wasn't programming professionally back when the Java four to five or one to four to five with generics or the Java six to seven or Java seven to eight or, you know, some of those have been around before, but, um, you know, they, they've, they've always been a huge um, hassle for various legacy software. And, and this whole release cadence is supposed to actually help prevent that issue. Um, so, in that mind, um, what I'd like to see, hopefully, from our point of view, is of course we we make sure that we keep Java 11 as a first class citizen because that's still like the main um, LTS release, and Java 8's um, support is still is is still kind of there, but it's mostly I mean it's almost like paid support at this point. I mean there's still the Open JDK things going on with it, but um, you know that's basically only getting security updates at best, and that's because of companies like Red Hat and other and other people like continuing to backport updates. Um, what I'd like, but what I'd like to make sure that we do is continue to, um, not only with Java 11, but at least try to, um, run, uh, continue integrating with the latest JDK each time that comes out basically, uh, to make sure that we are, um, continuing on that. And, um, I think that about covers it. Does anyone have any questions? Or... Yeah. A, a proposal on how we might do that um you know do we want to do we need additional agents on our ci infrastructure with those jdks installed um how often do we need to test uh do we need to test all the plugins what, what's kind of your recommendation there so i'm thinking some sort of integrate like some full-on integration tests on like a periodic basis would probably be good enough for now because it's mostly to try to i would imagine a lot of the issues, if they were to come up, would be caught in compile time because it'd be like, hey, this thing doesn't exist anymore, or hey, you know, this thing changed. Um, I'm, I, I know I've been bit by issues of uh, the byte buffer API has changed a little bit, for example, between Java 8 and, uh, and newer versions, like they, they changed an int to a long to make it uh, actually support, you know, more than two gigabytes of memory, for example, um, and, and, and things like that can trip you up um, if you're not actually, uh, um, cross compiling, I guess you could say. And then uh, I guess there's also, I, I don't think Jenkins has had to resort to using this yet, but one other um, tool that we've used like in Log4j, for example, is the Maven tool change plugin, which allows you to, uh, to configure multiple JDKs to uh, run in a single Maven build. Um, we basically had to do that in the past so that we could continue supporting Java 8 as our baseline, but we'd also have some specific Java 9 or even Java 11 now, I guess, uh, specific version specific code that gets bundled in um, using the new uh, version specific code feature um, uh, of um, of Java. Now I will note that the IDE support is fairly lacking uh, in a Maven tool change thing. I mean, it it, it mostly works. It's just uh, it, there's no it's it's not convenient, I guess. So it's something like. Um, I've seen one of the workarounds we've done here is um, someone, uh, I forget who, but somebody had written a small little library, like a fields accessor type of library for the Java 11 migration. So 
it, to avoid um, developer issues too, if you ever need to make uh, Java 9 plus specific code to pull in, you could try and make it into a, a multi-version jar basically. And, and instead of having it directly in your project, just to, just to make it a little easier to edit. But then again, I mean, it depends on what you're editing with, editing it with. I mean, it's possible if you're using NetBeans, it, it works perfectly because, you know, that's basically a GUI for Maven, it seems like, but you know. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, one problem with uh, supporting Java versions is because uh, just testing of them comes at cost. It's not only infrastructure; it's also ensuring that at least uh, it's doing something uh, passes uh, basic builds. Uh, because yeah, what we hit with Java nine, Java eleven, that uh, Jenkins wouldn't even uh, build on these versions. And I'm pretty sure if we try uh, building it on Java uh, GDK fourteen. It won't be built as well. Uh, at least uh, on GDK 12, it didn't build. It, it did run, but uh, not built. So supporting uh, new Java versions is quite expensive. And if you want to do that, uh, we actually need a, um, a team behind that. Uh, so yeah. for example, uh, Java 11 support, uh, we had almost 50 contributors at different stages mm -hmm. who were contributing that. Obviously. Yeah, if somebody was working on that, let's say, just one day per week, we could pull it off. Uh, but still, it's quite difficult. Uh, what we have on the Jenkins roadmap, yeah, we have Java 14 plus support uh, in the future, and also cloud native Java like Quarkus uh, or Graal VM, um, which is a completely separate topic um, and completely separate challenge. So I totally agree we need to do that, but we need contributors who would oh, how about the Graal VM ones? You know, that's another challenge I'm, I've am i been facing like for j as well, um, mostly around reflection because they don't fully support the reflection. No, they don't fully support the new reflection APIs, I should say. They support the standard old ones, but the, you know, the high performance method handles, var handles, all the other handles, those are all too low, too low level for Graal VM to understand at the moment. So uh, yeah. Jenkins so, would be a very interesting project to get working in that system. Yeah, right. But I so, see that would be long term. Would, is, is there a way that we can, uh, I, so you said it, it you said uh, you've at least been able to run Jenkins with the newer version of Java in the past, right? So is there a way that we can um, kind of run some basic tests with Jenkins on the latest JDK, just running it, not necessarily building it? Because I mean, that would be a good first step. Uh, yes, and actually it's, this is what we were doing, for example, when we were working on Java 11 support. So I can, uh, this is really it will be an outdated presentation. But it summarizes uh, major uh, obstacles we hit when we were moving, uh, yeah, why it wasn't building, uh, tool issues we, we hit. So yeah, if you want, you can go through this presentation. Uh, but uh, yeah, in, uh, there is just a lot of different uh, hidden stones. So for example, we started from building on GDK 8 and uh, running on GDK 11. And actually it didn't quite work because uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, magic, for example, uh, again, uh, management of extensions, uh, management of annotations, uh, uh, and the GDK 11 flow, it just got enabled in uh, version 2.164, and before that, you wouldn't be able to build with GDK 11 at all, because it wouldn't start. Same for plugins. Oh yeah, I know, I, I, I have that. I had that issue pop up enough times I've noticed the error message uh, that I, I recognize it right yeah, away. I cannot find whatever crappy class in whatever uh, annotation. They couldn't find like some, yeah, some meta in file. Yeah, uh, so in principle it's possible, um, but yeah, the problem just comes at cost. If somebody wants to contribute uh, to maintain this flow, let's do that. Uh, but we cannot just uh, add an agent, uh, add another target, and get it running because it won't run. Okay, so it seems uh, so. It would probably. Um, I, I would hope that we can try to look at this before Java 17. I mean, that's a while from now, but you know, a while will creep up pretty fast. Who knows? Um, to at least make sure that to get an idea of what kind of work may may or may not be necessary for building on Java um, 17 in the future. Um, yeah, and it, so some sort of period, just smoke testing, just running it, would be interesting. Or yes, what, so, so what, 
what what was it that you did um then for this for the for this migration originally for running it was uh, pretty much the same as you described so okay. yeah um, jenkins historically supported java 8 for several years before java 9 was released and once java 9 was released we started getting some issues uh, from users because yeah, Java 9 is completely different from Java 8 and uh, nothing would really work. Uh, and at uh, Jenkins World 2017 Hackfest, uh, there was a first experiment by Batiste Matos and Mark uh, who tried uh, running it and reported a number of issues. So we discovered that uh, yeah, there is just a kind of worms. Uh, we agreed that we don't want to open it yet. And uh, uh, sometime after that, several uh, months later, we started discussing it in the community, and finally, uh, we had uh, started investing in that only in May 2018, when there was already the Java 10 released. We discovered that yeah, there is a lot more issues. We discussed it in the community, and finally, we uh, ran an online hackathon in June 2018 way we worked on uh, Java 10 support. Uh, we had uh, almost 30 contributors at this hackathon. Oh, I, I remember that one. That was around when, that was not long after I joined. Yeah, I believe you participated also. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, was our main uh, uh, resource investment, where we pushed uh, all common obstacles and the way we uh, fixed the issues on the table so we made pipeline working and we made blue ocean working and all the co common components in five days but again it required a lot of contributors but it was just java 10 uh, another blog post etc uh, so you can find this information on the jenkins website um, then we had uh, actually java 11 release candidate and uh, Jenkins was uh, running well on the release candidate until very last moments because uh, they uh, introduced some changes and actually uh, broke our update center logic. So when we had uh, Java 11 hack fest uh, after Jenkins Vault, or before Jenkins, after Jenkins Vault. So Daniel Beck, uh, me, Mark, and uh, several other contributors spent more time to expand testing and to close the areas. And actually we've got a prototype uh, working on Java 11 just uh, three days before GA version. Uh, so GA was on 25th of September. Um, but it wasn't at the end because after that we needed to do preview in weekly, then general availability in weekly, then general availability in LCS. And uh, this took us six months. And actually, yeah, it took us six months to get working prototype. 2G because of uh, yeah, because of fixing all CI/CD problems in Jenkins because of uh, fixing developer tool issues. We also discovered some regressions, for example, uh, Java XML bind removal, which uh, broke particular configurations, even if uh, we removed it from Jenkins core. And uh, over these six months, we actually had a number of contributors working, and thanks to CloudBees, uh, we had a team working on that just to get it over the line, but it was a massive effort. So, and basically what you propose much is assumption that this massive effort uh, can be done easily. So, and well, I'm hoping that after, I'm hoping that Java has, or OpenJDK has stayed true to their word and since Java 11 has made the updates easier um, or has made them less breaking. But, you know, you, you, I think you raise a, a fairly interesting point here. This is something that I've noticed, too, of my own lack of keeping up to date sometimes, um, is that uh, one, one of the nice advantages, though, up to this, uh, I got to say, of this um, release process now that they have is if you're actually trying out the early access releases like that or the release candidates, if you notice regressions or changes like that and you can report them upstream early enough, they might actually fix it. Whereas if you don't ever test it until after it's released and you go, and complain, they'll be like, well, where were you when uh, we were developing that feature? We don't yeah. care anymore. We're already five releases past that, you know? <laughs> yeah. We reported uh, a few issues. Moreover, Jenkins is officially a part of uh, the quality outreach program. Oh, cool. So it's a program by OpenGDK team, which basically that communicates uh, uh, new releases and coming changes. Uh, oh, for all the early access releases? 
uh, yes. Okay, uh, I've seen I've seen as well. Yeah, I've seen that same. I've seen that same subscription on. Well, I mean, of course, we have that on Lock for J, but we have. Uh, I I used to be I used to be on the Ant mailing list too, and of course they were. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were one of the. They were usually the project that would at least try to integrate the newest Java stuff first because they're like, well, if we want to make a want to make things compile, want to support the new compiler features, we got to add some ant definitions or whatever for it and, and, and then work from there, <laughs> kind of bootstrapping your way up into the Java ecosystem. Yep. And then, so and then you wait six years and then Maven finally supports it. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, technically, as a member of this project, oh, cool. uh, we are supposed to test these new Java versions. And this is something we probably need to discuss at the Jenkins board level. So at nice. some point, uh, Kiki basically nominated us and we've been added. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you want to really deliver on this process, it's actually a good thing to do in principle. But again, if we have contributors working on that. For example, Java 11 migration just didn't just fix Java 11 support. It helped us to update the entire tool chain and it helped us to introduce new features. For example, Dependa bot, uh, um, in our developer tools, because many issues we hit, they came from upstream. And we actually removed a lot of technical depth in the project by doing Java 11 support. So, so this might be uh, another technical debt opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I can see um, that, uh, th thanks for the info. I think that, that mm -hmm. this doesn't make sense as a super immediate um, project. Uh, at least the full on support like JDK 11, um, like we did in the past. Um, you know, that, that kind of a tough decision to make though. I mean, like depend like of how often to do that because following the LTS schedule of Java sort of makes sense because it's every three years, but it also depends on how much changes each time. So um, in principle, it would be best if we can do some minor um, testing. So I had a comment, uh, I, I agree in principle. In practice, uh, there is one issue, uh, extremely slow adoption of, of Java 11 and anything uh, beyond the Java 8. So our current installation rate for Java 11 is less than 1% uh, for Jenkins. And uh, it actually reflects the industry state. So many tools, etc., they still run on Java 8 and uh, the user is basically fine, even if we know in principle that Java 11 is better, it shows uh, better benchmarks. So until we, let's say, switch Docker images by default uh, to Java 11, uh, we shouldn't expect a massive adoption. Right. And uh, yeah, investing in uh, supporting uh, new Java versions, uh, again, is good in principle, but I'm not sure how wide is our target audience for that and whether we could uh, invest uh, the effort uh, better in other areas. So for example, expanding platform support. Oleg, that I'm fascinated by that low adoption rate. And you said that's industry-wide, not just how, where did, where did you find that cool data that, that really we've got a very small adoption rate for Java 11? That Yes, I can uh, find some new statistics. So my statistics actually come from uh, November last year. So maybe the situation significantly improved over six months, though I do not think so. Uh, but, using, but November of last year, we had lots of, we had, we had spent, that was already six or mm -hmm. nine months after we'd released general support. So, so that, yeah, so I would not expect it to have improved dramatically then either. That's fascinating. Thanks. Go ahead, Matt. Oh, I've, I've been trying to use Java 11 more, um, more, uh, I guess, more frequently, I should say, uh, you know, trying to make that my default Java home or whatever the latest version of Java is. But you know, of course, there's a, there's a thousand plugins that still have an old pre 2.164 or whatever, uh, 162, which, whichever um, of Jenkins, so that you know, you always have the build issue and, and, and all that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, I, like I, I haven't, at least while running Jenkins, um, like straight, you know, Java dash jar, Jenkins and dot ward types of things that worked fairly well for me, at least with uh, whatever newer version of Java I've had at the time. Um, I mean, I don't think this computer has uh, like practically every version of Java installed like I do on my other one, but uh, you know, like uh, it, 
And, and also part of this too is I also recently realized that um, home brews, uh, uh, the brew casks actually are updatable too nowadays. So I'm actually able to keep my uh, JDK up to date automatically. So that's also helping me try to stay a little more up to date on seeing if things are incompatible, um, even if I'm not using it in production. Oh, and that does remind me one of the other interesting, one of the, I guess, harder things, um, which is something that we uh, that came that we've seen in Log4j, but would be the same exact problem here, is that of course we want to continue supporting Java 8 because that is the main um, you know platform for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, I mean, even as the even as the newer version of Java come out, you know, who knows how long we want to keep Java 8 as a baseline based on our users. On the other hand, we'd still, if you you know as you're continuing to support newer versions, basically you have to doing them both concurrently. The only the only way to, to do do that over time is through the like multi version support of things and try and and basically designing things in such a way that you know like you, you might have here's the here's the default implementation and then here is the swap in that implementation with this when we're on a newer version and it starts to become a little more like C programming or something where you have all these if the equivalent of if defs and and platform specifics oh well this is Jenkins so we have some of that in there too but you know. Uh, it, it'll, it'll be interesting. Yeah, we already have multi-release jobs inside the Jenkins package. Um, it was one of the main uh, challenges for developer tool updates. Yeah, I, uh, so. we, we had that same issue. The first time we made a log4j release with a multi-version thing, we had complaints from people like, oh, my Android tooling is, is blowing up. And it's like, well, it's not supposed to be scanning in that folder. And the same story for like 800 other tools. And yeah. it, and I'm sure you came across like half of the same ones as we did, or probably yeah. almost all the same ones. Yeah, when we were working on uh, Java 10 plus support um, in 2018, even the Maven compiler plugin it didn't really support multi-release jar. And it was uh, one year since the Java 9 release. Yeah. So now it's much better. I remember the initial, the initial stage of trying to support multiple releases of Java and stuff was basically, Oh, are you using ant? Here's an easy way to do it. Are you not? Oh, sorry. Well, here's a, here's how to do it. Here's how to call ant from Maven. What? <laughs> so it got super complicated. Yeah. So, so I think that I, I think that covers the topic, though. Um, hopefully, yes. uh, I'll let you know um, in the future of my own um, personal running on the newer versions of Java if I come across anything. Um, but yeah, I can see this being a uh, longer term discussion. Great. Thank uh, you. Should, uh, keep discussing this topic. Cool. Um, yeah, what exactly we do with Java 14 really depends on contributions. Because if somebody has bandwidth and interest, uh, we can do that. We fixed our infrastructure, we can uh, easily add new Java versions uh, to testing if needed. Uh, and we may need it for other purposes, for example, uh, new platforms or just switching uh, distributions to adopt OpenJDK. Well, uh, our CI Jenkins IO actually already runs on uh, Java 11, and we mostly use adopt OpenJDK across the setup, uh, but uh, yeah, still uh, there might be cases where you want to test multiple Java versions. You know, if there's uh, one uh, little feature maybe to help um, get anybody excited about trying Java 14, uh, I, this got me excited from a weird point of view, but basically in Java 14, they, they have a, um, I don't remember if it's a preview feature or if it's fully released, but basically they've updated um, the byte buffer API so that you can, you, you can actually directly access NVMe uh, memory um, straight from Java so that you can do high performance off heap type of stuff and, and, and whatnot through, and not just from RAM, but through NVMe. So, um, to me, that would be useful from a logging, a super high uh, throughput logging or type of message queue system. But Jenkins is low level. It might find something handy there if anyone in the community likes that kind of thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Matt. I think we need to we need to proceed on to our other topics. Thank you very much for the Java status. Yeah. Thanks for <clears throat> listening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So um, next topic we had on the agenda was the core release project. Um, Oleg, did you want to take a minute and summarize where we're at there? Do you want me to? Uh, please feel free uh, to summarize it. I was talking too much already. Okay, so Alex, you can you can chime in if I make some mistake. 
Jenkins 2.232 and 2.233 have both released from the core release automation project. 2.32 had some packaging bumps and bruises that were resolved in 2.33. Uh, we've still got more uh, items that will need to be resolved, uh, but it's making good progress. We're pleased with the progress. Uh, next stops, we'll be working on how to do the workflow for security releases and how to do the workflow for long-term support releases. We're really pleased with it. Uh, be aware, this is a crucial time for testing of weekly. If you find a surprise in weekly here that's related to this build transition, it's, it's much more interesting now than it would have been four weeks ago. Uh, any questions with regard to core release project? Okay, next topic, Windows installer. Alex. So the one of the items from the core release is that the new uh, Windows installer is being built. Um, there are still some issues, issues in having the final artifacts uploaded uh, during the release process. Um, I think uh, Olivier is looking at that to determine what's what's wrong. Um, so we're just working through that. Um, I'm adding some tests for Windows installer to your uh, install tests in the packaging repository. Um, so I'm just working through some issues there. Thank you. And so everybody's clear. Thanks to Alex's changes, the Windows installer shrunk by almost 50%, right, Alex? If I remember right, we went down from over 100 megabytes to on the order of 60 megabytes as a Windows installer. So yeah, now the, now the biggest artifact is just the, the war file. <laughs> which yeah. is great. Inside. It's kind of shrink it's too impressive. Much. You, yeah, and that, Art installer is usually bigger than the program? <laughs> because we used to bundle GDK, and now yeah. we don't. Right. Uh, that's easy. Well, and, and nice. that, that, that change now allows us to run 64-bit out of the natural and out of the installer, out of the Windows installer, if the right. user chooses a 64-bit JDK. So the Windows experience has improved. Thank you. Yeah, right. Before that, it was inherently broken because we were installing 32-bit uh, Java. So we were running in a WoW 64 mode, basically, uh, in Jenkins. And we know that there are some limitations, for example, for Windows process management library. Yeah. If you want to terminate processes, and um, yeah, more other things. Uh, so, yeah, great to see it finally landing. Excellent, mm -hmm. Alex. Next topic: plugin installation manager. So, I um, we've talked about it for a while of integrating the plugin installation manager tool into Docker images. Um, since I have a my main Docker platform right now is Windows, um, I have a Jenkins master on Windows PR, and I'm incorporating the plugin installation manager tool um, with good success so far. Um, so I, I'm just working through um, some issues, and then I'll push that as part of my PR for the Windows master image. And then I'll look at, um, I, I do have some Linux Docker platforms. I, I, I can then go look at the Linux Docker uh, images incorporating that tool. Any questions for Alex with regard to plugin installation manager and its integration into the Docker images? I fully support that. I would be interested uh, to discuss a better loud plan because there are basically two ways. One is just uh, replace uh, install, install plugins uh, shell script. Another way is to add a plugin manager tool in parallel change the documentation and also this experimental feature but uh, uh, change install plugins SH only when we are fully uh, confident that uh, it behaves similarly. Because if I recall correctly, there are some uh, minor issues, for example, in how dependencies are picked up. And uh, I'm totally willing uh, to get rid of install plugins SH. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe we should uh, have it as a two stage process. We, we also have um, plugins.sh, which is an even older method that is still yes. in the Docker images. So that, my plan was to get rid of that, but um, that just FYI, that, that's still there. Yeah, so I'm not sure what we could do about it. So obviously we can just announce it as, well, it was announced as a deprecated long ago. 
So I think that just remove it is uh, a good approach. Though I know for sure that uh, some companies still use this, uh, not in the Jenkins infrastructure, but uh, yeah, in other use cases. So maybe just uh, marking it uh, as deprecated, for example, in the change log and saying uh, the announcement would be a good step to go there. Thank you. Thanks very much. Any questions for Alex or for Oleg on Plugin Installation Manager? All right, next topic then was just a reminder that the platform roadmap has been published or has been through the governance board, it is still in, Oleg, would you call it still in draft state? It's still evolving and growing and developing, uh, but we've got a number of entries for, from the platform SIG on the, on the roadmap. Um, thanks very much to Oleg for leading that effort. The, the roadmap looks beautiful. Yeah, you can see it. And yeah, the most of items are actually uh, aggregated here. So it's various uh, Docker support, also multi-platform Docker images, which we still need to get over the line with the build flows. Uh, open uh, Gen 9, a new Windows installer, which currently can be moved to release stage. I'll probably update it uh, this week. Uh, also, we have some items uh, suggested uh, for the future, for example, custom Jenkins build distribution service. This is a project uh, uh, Rick is uh, working on. Then uh, there are also some uh, packages for Docker images, which we may include, but the roadmap is mostly there. And plugin management is actually also included, but it's uh, referenced in management and administration side right now. So if you click here, you still get to the platform seek uh, placeholder. And if somebody wants to provide uh, better documentation and description for this project, please do so. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Yep, that's very that's cool. cool. Like, like that guy said on Twitter, it's cool to see a software roadmap again. <laughs> you know, like, oh, there's direction for a project. That's cool, you know, most, most, most software is just kind of, you know, winging it nowadays. <laughs> it is it is delightful. All right, next topic. <laughs> next topic is the Series 390, the System 390X and PowerPC infrastructure progress. Uh, this is Jim Crowley. Anything you wanted to ask there? We've got we've I can give my report. Um, no, go ahead. Uh. Okay, so we've 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 delayed the use of the S390X and PowerPC infrastructure that IBM has kindly provided for us on ci.jenkins.io, but it continues to be used in my test environment. Uh, so Jenkins 2.222.2 release candidate was spent the last week or more on my test environment using the PowerPC and Series 390, System 390 um, agents. So now, I'm assuming, Jim, that a first preference is agents as first target, and someday in the future that they'll likely want to run Jenkins Masters. I know that there are Jenkins Masters running on those classes of equipment in other places because I see bug reports in JIRA on them. Mm. Um, I think actually priority uh, from the interesting, like from people like in my team is the master and then agents. Oh. Um, there actually was, I was going to ask, uh, Alex this today. Um, there was interest in the, the agent the other day, uh, I literally got pings asking if there was one. And I looked at the evals, um, the, the, you know, the Docker hub eval, um, user, and I didn't see any multi arch containers for the, the Jenkins agent. Is that, I just saw like windows, I think, um, being pushed there. Those would be um, um, probably being pushed to a different area, not the agent, but they would be in um, um, I'll find it and send the, uh, info. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I was just wondering that because I was on trying to point them. I was like, hey, you probably can just build them. I imagine they work fine, but Oh, we're, the reason there's only windows there is because we have to use uh, our CI infrastructure to build the windows 
um, Docker images and push them. Um, mm -hmm. For uh, the Linux images, we those are built on Do Docker Hub builds right now. So that's okay. why they're they're not being pushed there right now. Okay. We only have the for for MultiArc. We only have stuff for the master right now on the Jenkins for eval. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, Alex, did you get a chance to look at uh, the PR I have open? I I ran a build locally. Um, I'm I'm going to review the scripts a little just a little bit more. Um, okay. And but things are looking fine to me, uh, and I would like to get that through for you right. pretty soon. So. And I think that was the next topic that you were just just discussing, Docker PR status. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Anything else on S390 or Docker PR? Um, no. I mean, just let me know if you need any help uh, testing anything. Um, I'm happy to lend a hand. So. Great. Thank you. Uh, Oleg. Agent images have been renamed. Do you want to give us a summary there? Thank you very much. The word slave is gone in one more place. Uh, well, actually in multiple more places because we were able to remove around 100 occurrences from the documentation. Um, but there is a catch. Uh, so one thing that yeah, we renamed uh, three images. So it's now Docker agent, Docker and Bout agent, and Doc SSH agent. And with Docker SSH agent, we still have an open question how to name that. So that's why I postponed announcement a bit, but I think it's uh, time to proceed because I reached out. Uh, there is a developer mailing list thread uh, where I basically I asked people, okay, uh, would it be SSH agent or SSH built agent? Because both options have their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, there was no consensus there. Uh, I offered ways to vote. Uh, nobody really stepped uh, up. And since uh, all maintainers, including Alex and you, Mark, agree with SSH agent, at least in principle, I suggest to just uh, take an option unless somebody shouts we uh, keep it as is. Mm, and I'm going to write a blog post uh, which just says a bit that. The current name is agent uh, slash SSH agent, and uh, yeah, it is a potential subject for another renaming, but yeah, feel free to contribute. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I agree with the logic that was offered in that in that developer discussion. Uh, my mm -hmm. my fixation on SSH agent as a command I execute from the command line is probably uniquely my experience. But no problem. Well, Thank you. Yeah, there is a problem because uh, there is. Uh, Apparently, a Docker image for SSH agent. Oh, uh, yeah, not an official one, uh, and it's called uh, something slash SSH agent. I don't think that it's a big deal, um, but yeah, basically, it's contributor driven. If somebody wants uh, to rename it to SSH built agent or come up uh, with a new name which would actually uh, got, uh, get uh, more votes, just to do that. Right. There was also SSHD agent, but basically it's exactly the same like SSH agent. Uh, so. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. We are nearing our end of time. Alex, was it you who added Windows support for agents as a topic? Oh, Oleg. Go ahead, Oleg. Mm -hmm. So yeah, actually my question is, is it a good time to announce G for them? Because uh, historically, Windows agent images were in experimental status, and we have never announced that uh, now they're fully supported. But in fact, we ship them, uh, we test them. So is there anything else left to do before we announce that we support them? I think we could announce it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it would be great to have a kind of blog post or whatever. OK, I can and work so on something like that. Yeah, if you could, it would be great because yeah, we can always use more content. And okay. Actually, fully supporting Windows agents is a good milestone. Sounds good. 
-hmm. So, and when, when we're saying, just for my clarity, when we're saying Windows support for a Docker agent, this means the agent that's executing is running on a Windows nano server image, or it's running or, on a... Or Windows server core. Okay, but it's, it's running on, on a Windows kernel, not on a Linux kernel. Correct. Right. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Actually, you have, uh, you have to have a Windows server mm -hmm. that supports Docker for that, but there are people out there who, um, who actually do that. <laughs> yeah. So it's is the, it, do people sorry. already do this with um, zones and jails too? Like the old school versions of containers? Well, so for agents? I do. I run a, an agent in a, in a jail, but I don't think that it's very, very common. Whereas Dockerized Windows Docker agents, I would expect to become very, very common because of how popular the Windows Docker and, and Microsoft is pushing it pretty hard as far as I can tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus on things like Amazon and um, Azure, you can use um, Docker images. Uh, so the cloud providers are, are allowing you to use Dockerized um, contain or containers for build agents mm -hmm. and stuff like that with their various plugins and so forth. So it's, and Kubernetes um, has support for Windows uh, container pods as well. So it, it's becoming more prevalent. This yeah, is good for me as a one user should... who just needs to build on Windows, not use it. You know, I like, I, I, so th thanks for uh, actually improving that Docker situation because, you know, I don't really like downloading 8,000 gigabytes of things every time I want to test Windows. Yeah, you do have to have, so Windows containers don't run on Linux. Uh, so you have to have a Windows system that supports Docker to run those, but. Yeah, getting a VM for that is, is, has been fairly simple for me. It's just yeah. all the other setup involved with a normal Windows server would be, is obnoxious, but Dockerizing it would make it as easy as it ends on Linux. Yeah, and we have, so we have containers with, they have Git installed already in the container. Um, we have ones uh, that will have Maven and stuff like that. So they're, they're different options, so. Okay, so one comment, uh, probably something we need to address before JA. If we talk about cloud providers, you cannot uh, use uh, the current agents on uh, GKE. Uh, so it hasn't been reported in uh, uh, the Jenkins uh, bug tracker yet. Um, I shared the link in the meeting notes, uh, but too long didn't read. Uh, if you want to use uh, GKE, we need a 1909 core instead of 1809. So question, whether it makes sense to migrate before we announce GE. So the, the only thing we have to figure out is if um, the Windows 2019, because you can't build a, a Docker image for Windows on a higher release version or for a higher release version than what you have. So if the agents that we have on ci.jenkins.io are not 1909, then we can't build a 1909 image. Um, you can only build the current or less um, version. So I could do a test on that and see if I can um, build a 1909 image and then we can switch and it shouldn't be a problem. Yep, so it would be just good to do it first because uh, GK is quite a popular use key. So. All right, I think that covers all our topics. Any other topics before we close our meeting? Yeah, one topic maybe for SIP members that uh, we plan to participate in a Google season of dogs. At least we are doing a best effort attempt. And if there are any project ideas which are related uh, to platform support, and especially if there are mentors uh, who are interested uh, uh, to help uh, with such projects, then uh, please uh, submit your project IDs. I have just uh, filed a pull request which uh, um, creates a landing page. Oh, I haven't really filed it. I will file it in one minute. But yeah, we are looking for documentation specific project ideas. Excellent, thank you. And DocSig will meet tomorrow. Yeah. Anything else before we conclude our meeting? Okay, thanks everybody. Recording will be posted. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Thanks everybody.